Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is our first opportunity to do a Women in Law and Women in Business conference. And we are excited to have all of you with us. Um, this is our opportunity. We wanted to come together um, and start talking about what it is to become um, and be a woman of vision and a woman of leadership. As we are in the latter days, um, much will be expected of us. And it is interesting as we bring, to, bring us together and feel of the strength and the nourishment that we get from each other that we will be able to go out throughout the world. And it is exciting because we have people from various places um, in the US. We're also doing recordings um, so that we can also be taking some of this information to um, our sisters worldwide. We'd like to start off the day um, with one of our committee members. So for the last year and a half, women in law and women in business have been working together and we've been doing webinars. Um, so we have 11 webinars already out and you can uh, view those either from uh, the women in law or the women in business side. Uh, Christina Navaris is one of our committee members and I have asked if she would um, start us out this afternoon with an opening prayer. So thank you. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this opportunity that we have to meet as women in business and women in law to discuss how we all could, could make an impact as women and leadership roles in the church and in our communities. We ask a special blessing to be upon each one of us that we might listen to the speakers today and think of ways that we could help our community, help our fellow sisters, be leaders in our communities, and set an example of truth and integrity. We are so grateful for those that have volunteered to organize this event and to invite our speakers to speak today. We ask that a special blessing upon each one of them, that they might be inspired to say the words that we need to hear in order to make a difference in our communities. And we say these things humbly in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Um, I would like to turn the time over to Gayla Sorison from the law school just to give a few introductory remarks and then also from the School of Business over to um, Michael Thompson to welcome us. Gayla. I love being with um, fellow students, fellow uh, professionals, with others who are excited about the value that comes from being a community that's engaged in good work. And I appreciate the time that you're investing in being with us. I am currently the Dean of External Relations at BYU Law. Um, so in, under that umbrella, I have our alumni chapter as well as the Clark Law Society. There's a great deal of overlap between those two um, organizations, but each has some members that the other doesn't. So it's a wonderful broad group that I am proud to be a part of and that those of you who are part of those groups in particular, I'm looking forward to getting to know you and to getting your, your feedback and your input as we plan events and activities and try to strengthen our sense of community and what we can accomplish as a community. I'm grateful for the strength of sisterhood and um, for the wonderful opportunities we have to share what we have in common, but what I have come to value even more, and I hope you do as well, is to share what we have that is different, whether that's different skills, different life experiences, different passions, different interests, but to find the strength that comes from sharing those differences as well. So um, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for being a part of, um, of the great, great uh, group of women that are moving forward with uh, education and leadership and vision. And we'll look forward to sharing this time together. Well, I'm delighted to be able to take a moment to also say welcome and thank you for being here. Uh, we've got everyone in the dean's office today pretty spread out um, across the country and, and across the building, but I'm honored to be with you. 
Um, it has been fascinating to be involved in what I think is an extraordinary uh, set of initiatives that are unfolding on the BYU campus. Um, we are delighted with the things that our uh, colleagues in the J. Reuben Clark Law School are doing, and I think many of our programs, and especially our professional schools across the campus, uh, have a lot of energy and a lot of commitment to the kinds of things that you're going to experience together this afternoon. Um, we've been involved now for quite a few years in something that we call the Women's Initiative here in the BYU Marriott School of Business. Tina Ashby, who's here and who works in our placement operation in the finance program, was the first person who was in that role of leading the women's initiative here. And uh, I vividly remember a conversation with Tina when she sort of unveiled her ideas about uh, bringing a large number, inviting a lot of students, BYU women students, to come into this building for a large-scale open house. And it sounded exciting, but I thought, you know, it may be a little beyond scale for the first year. I said, Tina, if, if, there, were f if there were 100 women students from across the campus at that first event, I personally would be thrilled. I said, in fact, I'd be happy if there were 50. And she looked at me patiently, you know, just patiently, and said, uh, well, we can do much better than that, Michael. And I think there were about 300 people at that first event. And that has become sort of a, a historic event um, in this effort. It's wonderful now that in this building, when st women students come into the building, they actually see large groups of other women. And uh, they also contribute, of course, immediately to the work of students in their programs and uh, they have a lot to share with our male students. Our male students have a lot to learn from them. And uh, it's been just a great partnership and a great experience to, to witness. Thank you so much for everything you do. Whatever role you're in, uh, you do wonderful things. And we're grateful to you. I'm grateful especially to the support that we have here in this college among our faculty and professional staff. I think the students feel their support, they feel their commitment, and uh, they appreciate the example they set. And that's how we feel about all of you. I hope you enjoy your afternoon. Thanks again, take care. So I suppose it would be good to introduce myself. My name is Angel Zimmerman, um, and I am the International Women in Law Chair for um, the two years. Um, about a year and a half, well, about two years ago, um, I was asked if I would meet with uh, Chet Harmer, um, who was on the um, w president for the BYU Management Society. And Chet asked um, if we could start doing some initiatives between uh, the law school and um, women in business. And it is um, through that invitation that we started working on mentorship. And then we grew and said, you know what, there is an even better way to reach out and touch women. And then we started the webinar um, program. I would um, next like to bring up um, Rixa Oman um, because I have a special thank you for Rixa. So the BYU um, and J. J. Reuben Clark Law Society um, has, was going through transitions, and I am not um, a BYU alumni on the management side or on the law side, so I am from Kansas. I'm very excited to be asked to be the international chair, but I learned how to latch on to this woman. <laughs> And, um, and through her support, um, the webinar series has been fantastic. And the, are now, the invitations are going out to thousands of women. 
and um, our viewing of any one particular webinar is that magic over 300 mark. Um, so we are really making an impact. Um, when we started making the decision that we wanted to do a joint conference, again, it was Rixa Omen. And I am especially great, grateful for Rixa for you guys to understand that um, this is her last event with us and that she asked for special permission to make sure that this event happened. I am eternally grateful for that. Um, so I have a, a little token um, to represent the sunflower since I am a little Kansas girl um, and how the sunflower throughout the course of its day will always look to follow the sun. And Rixa has helped us become women of faith and women of vision. So thank you so much, Rixa. Actually, I'm, I'm just the email lady. Everywhere I go, people go, I got an email from you. Why did I get an email from you? Um, I'm serious in my ward as I wander around the world. Um, but thank you. There is so much good happening with groups like this, and we're determined not to, to continue it and to make sure that things will be strong and there'll be lots more events like this and more webinars. And, I'll do everything that I can, even though I'm no longer with the Management Society, um, to make sure that that happens. But we've had a wonderful committee that has done things, and all of you who are making such a difference wherever you are. Uh, that's what we need for professionals to meet up with students and for students to go out there and say, you know what, we're going to change the world, we're going to make a difference, and bring other women professionals together. So thank you for all you do. sure if she's here yet, but is Bridget Mandera Mandarin there? Okay. Um, it is wonderful that um, we have on campus, and she's going to stop by, um, a candidate for uh, the Dean Search of the Marriott um, School of Business. So it was exciting to see um, her um, sign up for this event as well. Um, I'd like for us to um, I get introduced and to do our introductory to our keynote speaker, Katrina Lantos Sweat. And that is from another member of our um, steering committee that came together with, with uh, women in law and women in business. So, um, Casey Hurley, if you would come and do an introduction. And it was fun. Uh, Casey had to really move kind of heaven and earth to get to be with us. Again, this is another person that uh, wasn't just around the block who could come in and, and join us today. So we're so appreciative that, that she was able to move things around and be with us today. And when she said, and I said, you know what, I'd, could, you, could you do something for me? And she's like, and when I told her what it was, and she's like, oh, that would be perfect because she's my hero, so. <laughs> that is true, thank you, Angel. I am so tickled to get to introduce uh, Professor Lanto Sweat today. Dr. Katrina Lanto Sweat serves as president of the Lanto's Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, established in 2008 to continue the legacy of her father, the late Congressman Tom Lantos. Under her leadership, the Lantos Foundation has rapidly become a distinguished and respected voice on key human rights concerns. Dr. Lantos Sweat is the former chair and vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom and teaches human rights and American foreign po policy at Tufts University. She currently serves as co-chair of the board of the Committee for Human Rights on, on North, sorry, Human Rights in North Korea, and the Budapest-based Budapest Tom Lantos Institute. Dr. Lantos Sweat also serves on the advisory board of UN Watch, the annual Anne Frank Award and Lecture, and the Warren B. Redmond Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Policy. Professor Lanto Sweat earned a political science degree from Yale University at the age of 18, a Juris Doctor degree from the University of California, Hastings College of the Law, and a PhD in History from the University of Southern Denmark. Sweat is married to former Congressman and, amb and Ambassador Richard Sweat. They are parents of seven children and two grandchildren. They live in New Hampshire. And I'll just say, I met Dr. Lanto Sweat just a few months ago, and 
I can honestly say, I think she's the most interesting woman I've ever met in my life. We could, I, I could promise you, we could sit here all day and listen to stories that she could tell about her family, her conversion, her experience with human rights and with religious freedom. She has done so many incredible things. Uh, so we're lucky that we do get to listen to for her for at least part of a day. And I'm just thrilled to be here and to listen to her. And I think the greatest thing about her is that she's just so down to earth. If you come and sit down next to her, you'll just feel like you're in Relief Society. She's wonderful. So with that, we are so excited to hear from you. Thank you so much, Casey. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And um, all of you, thank you for welcoming me here so warmly. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. I will say that um, whenever I have an opportunity to come and speak anywhere in Utah, I sort of jump at it because I am right now the, the mother of a second year law student at BYU. And so it's always a chance. He's here somewhere hiding in the back, but it's a chance for me to, to get to see one of my far flung children. I have to just say one kind of funny thing before I get into my remarks, um, because as Casey said, and that was such a lovely introduction, we had a great time at BYU-Idaho. Um, my husband served as a member of Congress, but also as the ambassador to Denmark, and we have a returned missionary from Denmark here with us today. And I just had to laugh as I was looking over the program, because we've got... Anderson, 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 and Sorensen on these breakout sessions. Now, I realize those might, some of them be Norwegian, because some of them are E-N and some of them are O-N, but it is um, sort of a sweet reminder of the fact that those who we think of as sort of the, you know, the American, if you will, bread and butter of the membership of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, actually are to a remarkable degree the descendants of those who set out on a treacherous and unknown journey um, at a time when doing so was far more difficult than it is now um, in, in pursuit of, of the opportunity to live their faith. And they were certainly women and men of vision and of leadership and of great courage. And it's just sort of fun to see that thread and how they now have, have populated to, to such an extent this wonderful place. I am very excited to be here with you today and I want to thank Gayla Sorensen um, and Angel Zimmerman for this invitation to be part of this terrific conference. As I thought about your topic, Women in Leadership, it occurred to me that it is a subject, leadership, that we too often approach from several steps in, rather than starting at the very beginning. We tend to think of leadership as a collection of attributes, strength, toughness, charisma, intelligence, etc. You can make your own list of what you think fits the profile of a leader. And then we sort of think that leadership actually consists in somehow scooping up these attributes, or at the very least, figuring out a way to be able to manifest them. And I think we too rarely pause to consider that leadership to be truly visionary, truly valuable, must flow from a deeper place. It should not be something we seek to acquire, but rather something that derives almost as a natural consequence from who we are and what we believe. My husband, who served in Congress, and as I mentioned, as our ambassador to Denmark, used to say, don't aspire to public office, aspire to public service. And I think he had that positioning just about right. Our desire should be for service, and perhaps, sometimes, the office, or the position, or the power may flow from that desire. Now, without naming any names or casting any aspersions on current or past political leaders, tempting as it is to do so, <laughs> but rather responding to what I think is a widely shared dismay um, at the caliber, or I would say lack of caliber of leadership 
in our country. I would suggest that part of the problem is that we have gotten up gotten caught up in identifying leadership as this collection of traits that I referred to without looking to the deeper wellspring from which leadership should flow. And very importantly, we rarely ask the question, leadership to what end? For what purpose? So today, in my remarks, I kind of want to go deep and go big. And I want to talk about leadership in the context of a subject which I have devoted much of my energy to over the past few years, namely the centrality of freedom of conscience and belief to not only creating true leaders of vision, but inspiring others to follow their lead. I'd like to begin with a true story from many years ago when I was a young lawyer working on Capitol Hill for then Senator Joe Biden, who of course eventually became Vice President Biden. At that time, there was a legislative aide who worked for another senator who happened to be pursuing me romantically. Seems like a long time ago now that I'm a, one update, I'm now a grandmother of five, not of two, and number six is on the way. But, but there were people pursuing me back in the day. Um, <laughs> and thanks to this particular young man, I was on the receiving end of one of the more creative pickup lines ever to come my way. Um, we were having lunch together in the staff cafeteria, and he said the following, and what's really weird about it, I don't know what percentage of this audience is LDS, but I'm guessing a pretty high percentage, and as far as I know, this guy was an LDS, but this is the scenario, this was the pickup line. He said, I want you tonight, when you go home and you're about to get into bed, to imagine that suddenly your room begins to fill with light, more and more light, until it's completely illuminated and bathed in light. And out of that illumination, you hear the voice of God. And he tells you, Katrina, I will answer any one question that you have. What would you ask him? And the the idea was that I would have a few days to think about this, and then I'd give him my answer when we went out on a date that week. And so it was pretty clever, (laughs) I must say. So what single question would you ask of God? I thought long and hard. And at first I did consider some of the obvious ones. How can we eliminate poverty? How can we achieve world peace? But as I pondered it more, I concluded that we actually probably already know the answer to those big questions. It's just that we lack the will, the moral will, the political will, to bring about those solutions. It's really not that we don't know how. And so in the end, I decided that I would use my precious encounter with deity to ask a very personal question. The query I decided I would pose to God if I had the opportunity was, what will be the great moral challenge of my life and will I be equal to it? Will I meet it? And if you think about it, that's kind of a central leadership question. Well, what I'd like to suggest to you today is that perhaps the great moral challenge, or certainly one of the great moral challenges of our time, is will we find a way to defend and extend the blessing of religious freedom, or more broadly construed, freedom of religion, conscience, and belief, in a world where it is surely in peril. The reason I consider this to be such a central question is that I am convinced that freedom of religion, conscience, and belief is truly the wellspring from which so many of our other cherished fundamental rights derive. Indeed, it has often been referred to as the first freedom, not only because it is the first freedom mentioned in the First Amendment to our revered Bill of Rights, but because it is the source from which so many of these precious rights we revere flow. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, equal protection of the law. I think a strong argument can be made that each one of these pillars of a democratic, tolerant, rights-respecting, and pluralistic society is anchored in the bedrock protection for freedom of religion. And so I would argue that its defense is truly one of the great challenges of our time. And I would argue 
that its defense is not merely a moral imperative, but a pragmatic one as well. A few years ago, I traveled to Berlin to participate in the OSCE, that's the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe's 10-year anniversary conference, examining the problem of anti-Semitism in the EU, which, as I'm sure many of you know, has seen an alarming rise in recent years. In fact, um, just a, literally a couple of days ago, there was a horrific incident in France where an 85-year-old Holocaust survivor was stabbed to death and then burned in her apartment in a small community in France. And it was clearly a, a hate crime directed at her based on, on her Jewish identity. Um, this conference was a sobering and discouraging event, and in many ways, um, it was a tough experience. But I had an experience while there that also reinforced my conviction that history is not kind to, nor does it ultimately reward those who trample on the religious rights and freedoms of others. This truth was vividly underscored for me while on a brief tour of Berlin during a break from the conference. I was struck by the comment of our tour guide that when the Edict of Nantes was revoked in 1685, thousands of persecuted Huguenots fled from France to the city of Berlin, where they started many of the industries and trades that ended up becoming the backbone of that region's economy. Now, you will recall, and I love to say that because, of course, who actually recalls the Edict of Nantes? Does anybody here recall the Edict of Nantes? No. And trust me, I didn't either. When the tour guide said it, I had to kind of go home and look up the Edict of Nantes. But it makes me, you know, gives me that little smidgen of, ha, 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 you know, you will recall. So we will recall together <laughs> that the Edict of Nantes, signed in 1598 by Henry IV of France, had granted to the Calvinist Huguenots substantial rights in a nation that was overwhelmingly Catholic. We might view the Edict of Nantes, the original one, as an early advancement of this idea of the right to freedom of religion, and its revocation was a huge step backwards. But the key point I want to make is that by driving the Huguenots out of their land, it was the French who ended up suffering economically and in other ways from their departure. And the land that gave them refuge benefited. Now again, I do not want to get at all political today, but I don't think it is too much of a stretch to see some analogies to the controversies that are roiling our nation today regarding refugees and immigrants who are seeking to come to our country. It's something to keep in mind. Um, we can look back through history, and obviously not without some reason and some rationality and indeed some limitations, but societies that welcome the stranger seeking freedom, seeking opportunity, those societies tend to be renewed and reinvigorated and ultimately strengthened by their willingness to open their doors. But the point today that I would like to emphasize is, and I think it is illustrated by the case of the Huguenots fleeing to Berlin, and that is that protecting religious liberty is not just the right thing to do. It is almost always, in the, in the long run, the smart thing to do as well. In fact, I have come to believe that our historically unique and incredibly bold idea in the United States to provide for both the separation of church and state and the unfettered free exercise of religion really was sort of the secret sauce that made our grand American experiment so extraordinarily successful. But while this broad and capacious understanding of religious freedom may have been distinctive to the American experience in the late 1700s, the fact is that now freedom of conscience and belief is a universal value endorsed by the majority of countries in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as in subsequent international covenants. Like every other human right, religious freedom is a birthright of humanity, and we are increasingly coming to recognize that it is a pivotal right, without which it will be difficult, if not impossible, to successfully address some of our gravest threats globally. So what do we mean by the term freedom of religion and belief? In Article 18 of the Universal Declaration, it is outlined as follows. 
everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom alone or in community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. This is a powerful, broad, generous, encompassing definition of freedom of religion and belief. And in the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it is further elaborated upon to extend this right even further. There, for example, we find protection from coercion that impairs someone's ability to have or adopt the belief of their choice. The ICCPR limits the circumstances under which freedom of religion and belief can be infringed upon for a broader public purpose. And it further discusses, for example, protections for parents in educating their children in their religious convictions, as well as protections for minority religious communities. It is an impressive international legal commitment to this fundamental right. But if we recast it in more human and less legal terminology, we might say that freedom of religion, conscience, and beliefs, belief means nothing less than the right of each of us to think as we please, believe or not believe as our conscience leads, and to live out our beliefs openly, peacefully, and without fear. It seems simple enough, and yet as I'm sure you are all aware, this basic human right is honored more in the breach than in its observance. According to recent studies by the Pew Foundation, more than 75% of the world's population live in countries that significantly restrict freedom of religion and belief. And this is not just a regrettable affront you know, to our um, sensibilities, to our values, to our aspirations for the world to be a nicer place. I believe it poses a real and growing threat to our own freedoms and even to our national security. If you pause to briefly consider the countries and regions in the world that pose the greatest risks to American security, you will find that in almost every case, they are characterized by severe violations of religious freedom. And it's not, I don't think, a mere matter of correlation, but there is a causation element there. Studies by Pew and others have found a strong correlation between the robust protection of religious freedom and a lot of other social goods, such as stability, prosperity, democracy, and interestingly for this group, higher socioeconomic status for women. Countries that do a good job, societies that do a good job protecting the conscience rights of their citizens tend to have far more opportunities for women in those societies. They get better educations, they have more work opportunities, they live better lives. The flip side of this coin is very worrying. Societies that restrict religious freedom become potential breeding grounds for instability, social tension, and violent extremism. Just look at the headlines. From Pakistan to Iran, Saudi Arabia to China, North Korea to Burma, wherever we see the repression of religious freedom, it is accompanied by a host of other manifestations of repression. And these pose real risks to all of us. I strongly believe that the protection of this pivotal human, rights, human right should be a profound priority for our nation, not only because religious freedom abuses violate the core of our humanity, but because they do grave harm to the order and well-being of societies. They do so politically, as religious freedom abuses are correlated with the absence of democracy and of broad participation from religious and ethnic groups. They do so economically, as religious persecution destabilizes communities and marginalizes the persecuted, causing their talents and abilities to go unrealized, robbing a nation of added productivity and reducing a nation's ability to fight poverty and create abundance for its citizens. They harm us civically, since wherever religious freedom is dishonored, the benefit of religion in molding people's character is diminished, and with it, 
the self-discipline necessary to handle the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. And finally, they harm us socially, since whenever religious freedom is abused, peace and tolerance become ever more elusive. If you think about it, it is the ultimate marker of a mature society when people of very different beliefs and convictions can, on a fully equal basis, inhabit the public square side by side with one another. To reiterate what I said earlier, protecting religious freedom is not only a moral and humanitarian imperative, but a practical necessity, one that is key to building a safer, more stable and secure world. And as I stated at the outset, people who have and who exercise freedom of conscience have the potential to become extraordinary leaders whose courage comes from their convictions. I'd like to share with you the story of one such leader, a remarkable woman who the Lantos Foundation, which I head, had the privilege of honoring with our highest award a few years ago. Vian Dahil is the only female member, oh, I'm sorry, the only female Yazidi member of the Iraqi parliament. The Yazidi faith is an ancient syncretic religion, and syncretic, for those of you who don't know, means something that combines elements from two or more sources. Um, and it's, so it's a, an old um, syncretic faith that combines elements of Zoroastrianism with bits of Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And it's estimated that there are between 600 and 850,000 Yazidis living in the entire world, with the vast majority of them residing in the Nineveh province of Iraq. So this is a small, tiny religious minority. Over three years ago, this ancient faith community became the target of a genocidal campaign at the hands of the brutal terror group ISIS, surely one of the most appalling abusers of the right of religious freedom that the world has seen. ISIS was determined to purify the land under their control of all those who didn't conform to their fanatical and very twisted version of Islam. Sadly, the world took little notice as thousands of Yazidis were killed and thousands more of their women and girls were captured and enslaved. Tens of thousands more fled their homes where they became trapped on Mount Sinjar. And in that forbidding location, they faced death through starvation, exposure, and from the killers of ISIS. No one was coming to save them. Not the Iraqi military, not the Kurds, not the Americans. They were a small, forgotten people about to be left to a tragic fate. It was at this moment of supreme danger that Vian Dahil stepped forward. She delivered a remarkable, impassioned, anguished speech before the Iraqi parliament in which she sought to arouse the conscience of a callous and indifferent world. If any of you have ever wondered whether one voice can make a difference, Vian Dahil's powerful call to action that day is incontrovertible evidence that the answer is yes. Her speech went viral, and within days, President Obama announced both a humanitarian and military effort to rescue the stranded and threatened Yazidi people on Mount Sinjar. Vian was an example of leadership being summoned forth from a deep well of conviction. She was, in that hour of peril, a woman of vision and leadership called to save her people. She was a Queen Esther. And I'd like to play for you now a brief video of this extraordinary speech that Vian delivered and its aftermath. I should mention before you hit play, that you'll see, um, this is a bit of a di digression, but the Lantos Foundation had nominated her and chosen her to receive our highest award, the Lantos Prize, and then she fell under the first travel ban that the new administration had put into place. 
And so this incredible woman who was number one on ISIS's targeted most wanted list was being for, pre prevented, prohibited from coming into the country. So we began a social media campaign to try and get her admitted so she could receive the award. And that's this video you'll see now. ISIS has targeted you. How worried are you? I'm not thinking about my life. I'm thinking, how can these small girls, maybe nine or ten, and they rape her? When I'm thinking about that, I, I, I say my life is nothing. Every time I watch the video of Vian's speech. I am riveted by her searing appeal to a seemingly heedless world. If you listen carefully, and I hope you were, you can actually hear the sound of an unseen voice attempting to shush Vian, in effect saying, calm down, don't make a scene. No one wants to hear you. I'm so grateful Vian would not be shushed would not quiet down, that the cause of her people was more important to her than the niceties of parliamentary decorum. When I see her speech, I am challenged to be more impassioned in my own defense of the defense lifts, to be willing to take more risks to stand up for my fellow human beings and their most basic rights. When I revisit that powerful moment, I find myself asking, what if? What if Fionn had not spoken out? What if her words, so anguished, so powerful, had not broken through the smug and distracted indifference that so often characterizes those in positions of power and influence, the traditional leaders, and quite frankly, sometimes characterizes all of us? Well, we can never know fully what the alternate outcome would have been, but we can say with assurance that tens of thousands more lives would have been lost, and a proud and ancient faith community might have been lost to the world. I have another thought when I reflect on Vian's remarkable cry for help, so different from any speech I have ever seen from a man. And that thought is that Perhaps because women, for most of history, have been on the outside, looking in when it comes to leadership and power, we as women may be less invested in the trappings and the protocol of power, and therefore more willing to make the sacrifices that constitute true leadership. It's something for us to think about. Vian's story and others I could share with you, such as the, again, very current and very recent story of a young Nigerian schoolgirl named Leah Sharibu. I don't know if any of you have heard of Leah Sharibu, but she um, is a young schoolgirl, not part of the Chibok schoolgirls from a few years ago, but another group of a hundred that were captured by Boko Haram, um, kidnapped. And uh, just a few days ago, um, all of the girls still alive, because some had passed away, were released except one, uh, a teenager, a little girl, 
um, named Leah. And the reason she was not released is she is the one that refused to um, convert to Islam. She was a young Christian girl, and she would not abandon her faith. She would not turn away from her beliefs, even to win her freedom. Um, so when I think about Vian, when I think about Leah, and many, many other such stories that exist, it causes me to reflect on what it means to live a life of conscience and integrity, and how living such a life can make leaders of us, whether or not we seek it. It can be, and I think indeed it is probably meant to be, a costly venture to live such a life. But the defense of conscience, whether our own or that of others, is a fight worth waging because it is so inextricably linked to our fundamental dignity and freedom as human beings. Now, one of my favorite works of literature is Robert Bolt's famous play, A Man for All Seasons, about Sir Thomas More. And I realize, especially since this is kind of a young generation here, that many of you are maybe more familiar um, with the depiction of, of Sir Thomas More um, that we see uh, by the British author Dame Hilary Mantle in her famous series of books um, uh, about that period in history. And she has popularized a much darker accounting of Thomas More through her books. But I remain a fan of Robert Bolt's depiction of the Lord Chancellor of England. Um, and I've often read his play, which as you can see, it's, my copy is literally falling apart. It is held together by a, a rubber band. And my family is often saying, Mom, can't we get you a new copy? And I say, absolutely not. You know, I am not relinquishing this because it's marked in all the right places and all the proper pages are turned down. And, and I, I have a connection now with this uh, bit of parchment. Um, but for those of you not familiar with the story, um, Thomas More was the Lord Chancellor in Henry VIII's England. And Henry VIII, who became notorious for having ultimately over the course of his life six wives, most of whom met their fate on the, uh, you know, the um, chopping block, literally. Um, but uh, the, the second woman that he wanted to marry, at that time, England was Catholic. There was only the, the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church. Um, and, uh, and the Catholic Church would not grant him an annulment of his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon. And so he was not going to be denied what it was he wanted. He and his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, had not been able to have children, so he sort of trotted that out as evidence that God had not sanctioned this marriage and that he was, you know, sort of following God's will by seeking this younger wife with whom he was infatuated. And ultimately, this led to the break between the um, Catholic Church out of Rome and the Church of England. And Henry declared himself the head of the Church of England. Well, Thomas More was a devout Catholic and could not countenance this. Um, and so he chose to resign as Lord Chancellor and withdraw to private life. Um, and one of the things that Henry was requiring of anybody in a position of power, including all of the clergy in England, was that they swear an oath of loyalty to him as the head of the, of the uh, Church of England. It was called, the, uh, I think, the Oath to the Act of Succession. And Thomas More knew he could not take that oath, but he did not seek martyrdom. He, as I say, sort of withdrew, withdrew from public life and sought to return to his family's home in the countryside and let these embroiling controversies um, that were uh, rending the nation sort of bypass um, their world. And in Bolt's play, we follow more as he tries to navigate the very tricky terrain between man's laws and God's laws, and his ultimate duty to each. And I'm going to read to you a couple of passages. First, early on in the play, after Moore has sort of, as I say, withdrawn from public life, he is visited by a very ambitious young man who wants Moore to help him get a position, a posting of some sort, Richard Rich. And um, 
the rest of the family is very suspicious of this guy, and they understand the danger that um, Moore is in. And so after Richard Rich has left uh, their estate, um, the family comes, his wife, his daughter, and his future son-in-law. And his son-in-law says to Thomas Moore, arrest him. His wife, yes. And Moore says, for what? He's dangerous, for libel, he's a spy. He is, arrest him. Father, that man is bad. And Moore responds, there's no law against that. There is God's law. Well, then God can arrest him. Sophistication upon sophistication. No, mere simplicity. The law, Roper, the law. I know what's legal, not what's right, and I'll stick to what's legal. Then you set man's law above God's? No, far below. But let me draw your attention to a fact. I'm not God. The currents and eddies of right and wrong, which you find such plain sailing, I can't navigate. I'm no voyager. But in the thickets of the law, oh, there I'm a forester. I doubt there's a man alive who could follow me there. And in the meantime, Richard Rich has left, and his wife says in a very exasperated way, and while you talk, he's gone. And go he should, if he was the devil himself, until he broke the law. So now you would give the devil benefit of the law? Yes. What would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil? I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Oh, and when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper, the laws all being flat? This country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down and you're just the man to do it, do you really think you could stand in the winds that then would blow? Yes, I'd give the devil benefit of the law for my own safety's sake. So here we see Thomas More taking refuge in the protection of the law and really not seeking out that martyrdom. But as I said earlier, sometimes when we are people of conscience, leadership finds us. We don't necessarily pursue it, seek it in a self-aggrandizing way, but it finds us. And so it was with Thomas More. And he is ultimately thrown into um, the tower, um, the infamous Tower of London, um, where he will be tried on charges of treason for refusing to swear the oath um, of allegiance, basically, to Henry VIII. And this last section, or this next section, is when his family comes to visit him with the intention of hoping to persuade him to take the oath so he can be freed. So again, this future son-in-law, who now is his son-in-law, is a very talkative fellow and sounds a little annoying, but very heartfelt, says, Sir, come out, swear to the act, take the oath, and come out. And Moore says, is that why they let you come? Yes, Meg, your daughter's under oath to persuade you. That was silly, Meg. How did you come to do that? I wanted to, Father. You want me to swear to the act of succession? God more regards the thoughts of the heart than the words of the mouth, or so you've always told me. Yes? Then just say the words of the oath, and in your heart, think otherwise. Ah, what is an oath then but words we say to God? Father, that's very neat. Do you mean it isn't true? No, it's true. Then it's a poor argument to call it neat. Meg, when a man takes an oath, he's holding his own self in his own hands like water. And if he opens his fingers then, he needn't hope to find himself 
again. In my work on behalf of religious freedom, I have had the great privilege of fighting on behalf of remarkable people, many of them women, who in matters of conscience and belief have the same commitment to integrity as Bolt's Thomas More. They too believe that they hold their own selves in their own hands and not even for the sake of their freedom or safety are they willing to open their fingers. I'd like to close with a story that I think beautifully illustrates the profound connection between religious freedom and all the other precious rights we cherish. John Wycliffe, the English philosopher, theologian, reformer, and preacher, undertook to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into the common vernacular in the late 1300s, and he did so in the face of enormous opposition and even persecution from the ecclesiastical authorities of his day. Despite all, he persisted in this mission. And when his work was done, he wrote the following words in the flyleaf of that first Bible. The translation is complete and shall make possible government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now, we all associate those immortal words with President Lincoln on the occasion of the Gettysburg Address but they have, as you can see, a more ancient patrimony. Now, we cannot know precisely what Wycliffe meant when he wrote those words, but I believe he was illuminating for all of us the profound insight that when men and women are free to pursue and understand truth for themselves, they become empowered as leaders to build societies that honor the claims of conscience and the fundamental liberties of all people. And so as I close, I return to the question that I intended to ask of God. What will be the great moral challenge of my life and your life? Perhaps it will be to defend this essential human right. And it is my hope and my prayer that we will be equal to it. And if we are, we will surely be both leaders and women of vision. Thank you very much. So, um, this afternoon to each of our speakers, um, we have a little token of appreciation that we'd like to give. Um, and this is from a studio in Kansas, Prairie Glass Studio, and it's a little necklace um, that is glass and wire um, that makes a puzzle piece. And um, to each of our speakers, we want to say thank you so much for helping be the piece that we need to be women of vision and women of leadership um, in this great time period. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. What a lovely, lovely remembrance of All right, and Rix is gonna come out up and tell us about our afternoon. Um, ladies, um, we are so grateful to have you in this room. Please understand that each one of you has been, is, and will be called to be leaders locally, nationally, and internationally. We are asking you today to be women of vision and leadership. We are asking you today to be more and to do more. Today, I want you to consider so much in this period of time, we talk so much about learning to say no. I am pleased to be a woman who appreciates and loves to say yes. We need to, um, I have a little acronym, yearning to experience and to succeed. That is what it means when we say yes. There are opportunities where it is important to say no, but use those words very cautiously and please think that if you need to say no, it is because 
you are seeking for in the next O opportunity where you are going to be a woman of vision and leadership. Please today, accept our invitation to say yes and to be more and do more. Rixa, will you please help us with the rest of our afternoon? Thank you for inspiring us. Um, this is the moment where you're gonna feel really good because you're gonna go, I would have caught that mistake, but they didn't. So, right? Do you ever have that moment of, I would have caught that, I see that spelling error. So you see this very nice program. At this point in time, I want you to ignore the room numbers on this page. <laughs> Got it? And look at the ones with the speaker pictures and take those room numbers, because those are right, because we got a couple of them confused. I mean, if I start talking about which ones are confused, it's to the Andersons, and you'll just like anyway. <laughs> so please look at those, and, and then we'll be straight, right? We're also gonna, she's running down to put, uh, pin up a little uh, picture and bio of the speaker on the door, so you'll know you're at the right one. But we, we felt like we wanted to give you a broad variety of women in different situations, and and things that they're doing and different possibilities. So I think you're gonna find these fascinating. Candace Anderson talk, uh, is, uh, has served in a number of um, roles in public service and is now on the Board of Supervisors of Contra Costa County. She's talking, gonna talk about women in politics and making a difference there. Bonnie Anderson is one of the department chairs here in the Marriott School. She's department chair of the Information Systems Department. And she's gonna talk about uh, thriving in a male-dominated field. And I'm sure many of you are in male-dominated fields, so I think that will be great. Jennifer Anderson uh, is a good friend, works with the Management Society. She runs a consulting uh, business and uh, owner of Career Coach Jen uh, will do a, a presentation on your personal brand foundation to your successful career. Uh, she does a wonderful job on this. I, I love Jennifer. I've known her for years, and she's as she steps out in leadership positions in a lot of organizations. Gayla Sorensen, who you heard from at the very beginning, the Dean of External Relations at the law school, is gonna talk about the value of education. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. Now try saying that fast. So, oh, the first three will go from 2.15 to 3. Um, so you have just a few minutes to get to the rooms. They are directly below. So two of them are on the third floor directly below us, and the next one is on the second floor directly below us. So you need to get down the elevator or right around the corner there's a set of stairs. And there's restrooms right here on each floor so you don't have to all stand in line here. You can go down to the other floors and they're all in the same place. So we'll do the first one for 45 minutes and we'll have a break from 3 to 3.15. That second breakout session will start at 3.15. Uh, with Gayla Moss, with Lori Wadsworth, who's another of the, uh, uh, is a department chair in the Marriott School and the Romney Institute. And she's gonna talk about managing work-life integration. And then Elizabeth Clark uh, will be the third uh, choice that you will have. And she's the associate director at the International Center for Law and Religion Studies here at BYU. And she will talk about religious freedom and the power of women of faith. So all very, very different, all tremendous wonderful role models who uh, I really look up to. So enjoy this and then enjoy your time mingling and networking and getting to know each other. That's part of why we're here. When we're done, as you can see from all the beautiful stuff in the back, come up here and get some light refreshments. We're gonna have some things for you all set out and you can come in here and, and continue the conversation, share some business cards, uh, make some connections before you go today. So be sure after your second breakout session to come up here and enjoy some refreshments before you go. We're so pleased to have you here. Please enjoy the rest of the afternoon. <laughs>